Hello, I'm Sami Zaydan. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your look at the world of business and economics. This week, the factory of the world has a forced labor problem. China's internment of millions of Uyghurs has Western companies scrambling to unwind supply chains. But are they dragging their feet as they face a backlash from Beijing? Also this week, a trillion plus in losses and millions of jobs axed. It hasn't been easy for the tourism industry. We find out if and when a recovery is in sight with the chief executive of a business travel platform that's raising millions for expansion. And aging populations, falling birth rates and fewer skilled workers. Industries are looking into the use of robotics. We look at how robots could change the construction industry. China's three decades march to become the factory of the world has been pretty remarkable. It's lifted millions out of poverty and millions more into the middle class. But under President Xi Jinping, China has a human rights problem. Investors are pressing corporations that do business with China to verify supply chains for the use of forced labor. The US and EU have imposed sanctions on Beijing for its treatment of Uyghurs. But up to 2 million have been placed in internment camps in the western region of Xinjiang. Many have been forced to retrain and sent to work in factories and cotton fields. The abuses don't stop there. Entire graveyards, mosques and historical sites have been bulldozed. Women have been forcibly sterilized and children taken away from parents. The US calls China's actions genocide. That's making it more difficult for some to continue to do business. Take Henes and Moritz, or as it's better known on the high street, H&M. After pledging not to use cotton from Xinjiang, it faced a backlash in China from the government and consumers. Burberry, Nike, Adidas, some of the other Western brands hit by consumer boycotts. The United States banned the import of cotton and tomato products in January. It's estimated the U.S. imported $9 billion of cotton products and $10 million of tomatoes last year. Supply chains for solar panels are also clustered in the region, raising concerns among investors about forced labor. In fact, half the world's raw materials to make solar panels comes from Xinjiang, further complicating the world's move away from fossil fuels. A report compiled by the German parliament concludes the country's new supply chain law will likely mean German companies have to withdraw from Xinjiang and related supply chains. Otherwise, they face fines or even criminal prosecution. Well, Beijing denies all accusations of abuse and is prepared to lose exports as China's consumers start spending more money at home. Joining us via Skype from New York now is Anita Dorrit, Director, Investor Alliance for Human Rights. Good to have you with us. So pretty much outsiders, whether they're diplomats or journalists or human rights activists, they're, they're barred from Xinjiang, right? So how sure are we of these reports of forced labor? You know, Uyghur human rights groups who have done interviews, as well as journalists who have done interviews of uh, people from this area in China, the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, that have escaped from there and have provided um, survivor accounts to tell us what has happened. And so they've worked in these factories uh, or been interned in these prisons. Um, in addition to that, there are journalists and other visitors that have been to this area since 2017 uh, and so have seen actually what's, what has happened in this region. So from that perspective, uh, my take on it is that the expert reports and the research that's coming out is informed by these personal experiences. There's also some pretty disturbing, mind-blowing reports about Uyghurs being sold on internet sites to factories across the country. I mean, how well documented are these reports? From our discussions, and we are in touch with a lot of Uyghur human rights groups. So the Investor Alliance is part of a coalition of, um, of, of about 300 uh, different civil society organizations that includes 70 Uyghur human rights groups. And so when we speak to them, they have families and relatives, and some of them were uh, actually working in these internment camps. So, you know, my perspective is um, these accounts are 
you know, uh, are definitely something we want to rely on and to at least have conversations and ask questions uh, about these concerns. Right, so you're clearly disturbed and taking them seriously. The US introduced a ban on cotton. They seem to be disturbed by these sorts of reports too. But despite that, we've still seen exports double in the first quarter of 2021. Why is that? What's happening? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it, it's quite puzzling to me, but I, I, I feel that at this point of time, a lot of companies um, just don't have a good understanding of their supply chains. They don't have a good understanding of what is going on in the Uyghur region. Um, you know, it is really just over um, the last year that more reports have come up. So my, my view is that companies are uh, starting to notice. They are starting to take, uh, to find out more about their supply chains and take that action. So my hope is that this trend of uh, trade, uh, as you said, that's increased from this region will um, at least stall a little bit. Um, there are various things that I believe are being um, imported in from this region. Um, the, a, a lot of the attention has been related to cotton and apparel products, but there are lots of other raw materials. So whilst maybe uh, the apparel sector have taken some steps, I don't believe other sectors have. For example, um, a report just came out um, earlier this week relating to the solar sector and the sourcing of polysilicon. Uh, and it, it's believed that you know, um, the, the region um, that we're speaking of, the Uyghur region, produces up to 40% of the global supply. So if that report is just coming out right now, um, I don't believe the, in the, the relevant industry has reacted to that as yet. But Anita, is so it just down to companies perhaps not being fully aware of their supply chains? Or is the increase in the trend that you mentioned of trade the result of a payoff of the, the Chinese backlash? I mean, we've seen some companies scrub language from their websites related to, you know, commitments on avoiding forced labor and so on and so forth. Is that the backlash driving the trend the other way? My hope is that it isn't. Um, it's whilst we were very troubled um, by that response by companies to the backlash, um, we still see that the majority of the apparel companies, based on that particular backlash of that series of boycotts, have to, to a large extent still remained firm on the issues relating to forced labor. Your organization has 160 institutional investors in its membership, right? You represent something like $5 trillion in assets uh, under management. Why is this issue becoming so important, do you think, to investors? Investors understand that they don't stand apart from the companies that they're invested in. They understand that their money is which is being invested in a company that may be complicit in, a, in human rights harms is something that they need to address. They want to ensure that where their investments are made, it goes into businesses that respect human rights. And, um, and with the trend, uh, as we can see in the capital markets, moving towards stocks and companies that address uh, ESG risks, environmental, social, and governance risks, uh, these are continuing to be more and more important across investments in the investment community. How compromised are companies that manufacture their goods in China to particular issues of forced labor in Xinjiang? You know, whether we're talking about Apple or Sony or Huawei or Dell or HP, or et cetera. Is it possible to, to know how compromised they are with, shall we call it, the Xinjiang issue? all companies have the responsibility to understand their supply chain. And that has been one of the things that has been quite alarming as we have conversations with companies and the lack of understanding of their supply chains is really quite su surprising. So I would say that companies need to understand their supply chains. They need to take steps to conduct human rights due diligence to understand where and how the labor in their respective uh, factories and supply facilities are, you know, where are they coming from? Are they from government mandated um, um, programs? Are there subsidies that these um, suppliers are taking from the Chinese government um, in order to support um, 
um, systems that are in place in repressive um, regions like the Uyghur region. All right. Thanks so much, Anita. Good talking to you. No, great. Thanks, Sammy. Thanks for having me on. The tourism industry has been the hardest hit by the pandemic due to travel restrictions. According to the United Nations World Tourism Organization, there were one billion fewer international arrivals in 2020. Well, that translates into a 74% slump from the previous year, making it the worst year on record. This compares with the 4% decline recorded during the 2009 global economic crisis. The collapse in international travel represents an estimated loss of $1.3 trillion in export revenues, more than 11 times the loss recorded during the 2009 global economic crisis. The crisis has put between 100 and 120 million direct tourism jobs at risk, many of them in small and medium-sized enterprises. Well, against that backdrop, one business traveler platform is flourishing. Travel Perk just raised $160 million in its latest round of funding. I'm delighted to say returning to the show is Avi Mayer, the co-founder and CEO of Travel Perk. Welcome back. Avi, the last time you were on Counting the Cost, you were talking to us about travel corridors ahead of the time when it was actually implemented. 2020, though, still a hard year. Why are your investors so confident in a recovery? Yeah, thank you for having me back, Sami, and uh, always happy to be here. Um, the investors have seen um, two things that are important, I think. The first one is that uh, one of the uh, clear understanding that we as, as, uh, you know, as a world have after 2020 is that the meetings that matter happen in person. And we feel it as we want to get back to meeting our friends and family, uh, go on holiday, uh, not on Zoom, but a real holiday. And it's true also for business meetings, the business uh, relationships and trust that we create by meeting other people in person. So I think 2020 has just shown that uh, deep um, truth about how we humans interact and trust each other. Uh, this combined with the fact that we grew in 2020. Travel Perk has doubled its size in, um, in terms of customer base in 2020. We didn't lay off our team, uh, which is a very unique in our industry. We just kept going. We kept... Um, uh, building the product and kept uh, providing great service to our customers. So we end up actually growing, doubling our size in 2020. So these two facts combined, um, I think, attracted uh, many investors. But doesn't that mean, I mean, if people are meeting less, especially business travelers, are meeting less face to face, doesn't that translate into, or it should translate into less business for you? Yeah, I mean, our, our size relative to the market is still, I mean, we're talking about a huge market of $1.5 trillion uh, globally pre-pandemic, and I'm very confident that it goes back to this number uh, in the next two, three years. So we're talking about a huge market, and our size as Trauper relative to this market uh, was still very small before the pandemic, so we had a lot of space to grow uh, during it. We acquired, as I said, many customers. And in fact, if you look at uh, the recovery now, in but the how, Evi, uh, what, what are you doing differently from everybody else who's losing money? We have a great product. Uh, I think it's a key. We're you know, using technology instead of only relying on human-provided uh, service, as, as traditional legacy travel agents used to do. Uh, the fact that we are a technology company, that we scale with technology and not with people, I think helps a lot um, in our, in our P&L, in our numbers. Uh, and also, uh, this is what customers are looking for, right? So you have, um, you know, kind of a perfect storm of great product meets uh, demand, and people still need to travel even now. You know, a lot of essential trips are happening, and uh, the travelers are looking for solutions, and they're finding travel work. Right, and we, we see some airlines dropping the price of business class travel. Clearly, they're not so sure corporations are going to be rushing back to in-person meetings anytime soon. Do you agree with that outlook? No, I don't. I think that some of the meetings, um, and speaking with our customers, you know, we serve today globally uh, more than 4,000 uh, companies, uh, mostly in the US and, and Europe. Uh, and when speaking with our customers, uh, they tell us that maybe 20, 30 percent of the travel budget is going to ba basically become a Zoom meeting. You know, this uh, unnecessary full day uh, trips just for 30 minutes transactional kind of meetings. I don't see any issue for these kind of meetings to remain on Zoom forever. At the same time, we have a new kind of trips that are emerging 
for example, from uh, distributed or remote teams that is now a trend that is increasing, uh, we see it increasing with our customers, suddenly you have people who never needed to travel, like software developers or product managers, who are based two, three hours away from head office or even in another country, and they need to travel to meet with their team to plan, to brainstorm, to uh, create something together. Uh, these kind of meetings have to happen in person. So it compensates for the 20, 30% that will hopefully uh, remain on Zoom. So I think net, net, we're talking about an industry that is going to uh, uh, keep growing in the years to come. All right, you mentioned the U.S. market there, and U.S. domestic bookings, they're, they're almost back to pre-COVID levels. Why is the U.S. market a little different, shall we say, from the international flights market? Our numbers are actually better than that, So because we are a growing company and we're adding customers. So at Travel we're actually today at double the size in U.S. domestic travel than we were in 2019, same month. Right? So we are doubling our size in revenue. Uh, compared to 2019 at the moment, uh, and we're still in, in the middle of this crisis. Um, the U.S. is different because of the vaccination and the fact that the country is big, right? We're talking about the single country where traditionally you have less restriction to movement, of movement within the same state or between states, and you combine it with a great vaccination project, and this is what uh, uh, the result looks like, right? And, and I think very soon we'll see the same in Europe, for example, where vaccination is finally picking up, and hopefully we should also see a corridor between the UK and the US opening up very soon. So I think it's all about the vaccination. All right, when though? Let me get you to try and look into your crystal ball for us. When do we think international, the international flights market is going to be back to almost pre-COVID levels? So as I said, for traffic, it's already uh, happening uh, globally, I think, and uh, you know, for the industry as a whole, uh, vaccination is the key, it seems. Uh, and then also government um, you know, easing the restrictions, but it, it seems to be sequence first vaccination and then the easing of restrictions. Uh, my crystal ball is as good as yours, but I would say around the summer or after the summer, we'll start seeing more and more international travel. Well, that summer isn't too far away. It's nice to have a bit of optimism on this show, isn't it? W uh, will we still have travel corridors? And for how long do you think? We think that this situation of uncertainty is going to stay with us for a while, uh, which is why we acquired a company actually, and now we have uh, a product called Travel Safe that provides the, the COVID restriction in real time to our customers. So you know if you need a test, if you need uh, to quarantine, if you need to show a vaccine certificate, etc. And it, these rules are, are changing, as we see now in the UK, for example, they're changing almost on a daily basis. Uh, green countries and amber countries and all of this stuff. So we are. Our, one of our missions now at Fabric is to provide this information to our customers in real time because, because of how volatile it is. And I think this volatility is going to stay with us for a while, which is also why we need flexibility and the ability to change the trips, cancel them without uh, a big penalty or any penalty at all if possible. Uh, and these two requirements, flexibility and information, access to information in real time, are going to stay with us for a while. So uh, my prediction is more than 12 months at least. All right, Avi, it's been good talking to you. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Sammy. China's census for 2011 to 2020 showed the population was growing at its slowest rate in decades. Births fell to just 12 million last year. That's the lowest figure since the early 1960s when China was emerging from a catastrophic famine. Well, across the Pacific, the U.S. fertility rate for 2020 has dropped to a record low of 1.64 roughly the rate in Europe over the past five years. For decades, the U.S. birth rate has helped propel growth. But with an aging population and fewer skilled workers, industry is already gearing up to roll out robots. None more so than the construction industry. In a survey of 1,900 construction businesses in Europe, North America and China, 91% said they face a skills crisis over the next 10 years. 44% say they're struggling to recruit for construction jobs. Now the company behind that survey is ABB Robotics. Its president, Sami Artia, joins us now from London. Good to have you with us. So there's a shortage of skilled workers in different industries, from ports to the construction businesses. Why not just open up immigration and use skilled immigrants to fill the gaps rather than robots? 
Well, um, there is a significant shortage. In, uh, in Europe, 200,000 uh, uh, workers are missing in alone in the EU. Um, I mean, also, there is, are also demands in the industry to increase productivity and also to have more sustainable way of building uh, houses and commercial buildings. So the skilled labor is, is one aspect of the total equation, but this industry will go through a significant transformation uh, like the automotive industry went through 40, 50 years ago, uh, where they started introducing, you know, robotization and automation. And uh, when we asked uh, our 1,900 construction companies, they said 81% of them said they would introduce robots and automation in the next decade. So what do you make then of some of those predictions that say that robots and artificial intelligence are going to make some of the middle class jobs obsolete? Is that going to cause massive unemployment and an implosion of the consumer economy as we know it? Well, if you look at the statistics, uh, the countries that actually deploy most of the robots, uh, which include South Korea, Germany and Japan, they have what we call above 300 robots per 10,000 uh, workers. The average in the world is around 70. Uh, they actually enjoy the lowest unemployment rate. And also the industries where we actually introduce robots, even customers, they um, enjoy growth and they deploy actually more employees. The nature of jobs, though, will change over time. That is for sure. And that's why we, we have uh, an obligation as a society and companies and the education system to, to invest in the reskilling of, um, of um, our fellow workers. Can robots do everything, especially on a, on a building site, which is full of obstacles? How do you get a robot to deal with that? Well, that's, uh, that's a very, very good question. You say, you know, there, there are two parts of this industrial automation in construction. One is on-site and the other is off-site. Uh, most of the automation will happen off-site, which is in the manufacturing. There is a big trend towards more modular uh, housing. So you basically uh, cut the woods up front, you design uh, with uh, digital tools like ours, Robot Studio, up front, and then you ship it on site, and then you bring the construction together. Nevertheless, there is also automation and robotization having happen on site. Uh, that will be uh, less the majority, but we have examples for a company, uh, Skanska, that does these uh, putting together the uh, the skeleton of the steel um, on site that used to be done actually on top of the building. Uh, and now it's done on the basement. And it used to take hand uh, crunch of about uh, one, uh, 16 uh, hours for one ton. Uh, they introduced robots and now they're able to do it one hour for, for one ton. So that's significant uh, change in this, uh, in this industry. So are robots going to be made only for specific tasks? Is that where we're going? Yes, robots can do repetitive tasks, heavy uh, load, uh, what we call the dull, dull dangerous and, and dirty uh, jobs the robots can do. Uh, we're expanding robots into more what we call unstructured you know, environments. To your point before, when you're on, the, on, on site, on the premise, there's multiple things that, that are unpredictable. So that's where the robot uh, needs to uh, get advanced over time. So we're adding vision system, but still there are many areas where the the human in an unstructured environment will remain superior. That's why what we're seeing more and more this collaborative robots. The robot uh, does certain works the human can approach and, um, and slows down the robot if necessary or it starts moving faster. So these are all technologies that we're introducing with our collaborative robots that eases the work between humans and, and robots. Okay, this is interesting. So give us an idea. What are the sorts of jobs the repetitive, the dangerous jobs that we might see robots rather than humans clustered in? Well, um, if you look at the, you know, automotive is a typical example where uh, this, this tedious work uh, is, is, is now handed over to, to robots. Uh, many of the, what we call, the, what take welding, it's, it's, it's a dangerous job because it's heat and, 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 uh, and an environment that is not suited well for humans. This is a typical job where a, a robot can, can do. Uh, a, we are working with a Schindler elevator where we introduced a robot that actually can go up the whole shaft of the elevator, which is a quite dangerous uh, work where humans actually less and less want to do. The robot goes up, scans the walls, and sees where uh, the robot can drill holes, 
and then goes step by step up and does the whole, the whole shaft. So these are areas where robots are better suited, reduces the, the health risk for employees, and also it's a productivity gain for, for the customers. All right, it's been uh, very interesting talking to you. Thanks so much, Sammy, for coming and sharing your thoughts. Thank you very much, Sammy. All the best. And that's our show for this week. There's more for you online, though, at aljazeera.com slash ctc. That'll take you straight to our page, which has entire episodes for you to catch up on. That's it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Sami Zaydan. From the whole team here, thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is next.